canine fitness program design. When we have a canine fitness program or we want to create a canine fitness program, we want to help our dogs get better, get stronger, healthier, faster, more flexible. Many, many times people say, okay, where do I start, Erica? How do I start? Where do I begin? How do I put this fitness program together? And I have a guideline. I have six steps that's going to help illustrate and talk you through and show the different steps that you need to consider if you're going to have an effective canine fitness program for your dog. Now, another thing that I wanted to mention um, before I go into these six steps, many, many times I have people and they'll ask me either for their own dog or for their business, they're wanting to kind of just create a, a plan for a dog or a group of dogs. So, you know, I want to have a, a cardio program, a beginner, intermediate and advanced cardio. Um, I have a, a program, I want to have a fitness program and put it up on my website and people can, can come and purchase a canine fitness program for their dog. And one of the first things I say is, I don't believe in creating a generic program and just handing off a generic program to a quote beginner dog, an intermediate and advanced dog. And this six, six step process is going to, hopefully it's going to show you why I don't think that's effective, why that can actually be dangerous for the dogs. Um, I truly believe that if you're going to build a fitness program for a dog, for it to be effective, you need to really look at the dog in front of you and customize it. There will definitely be things that you know are common across the board that you might have for a group of beginner dogs or more advanced dogs. But if you really want to maximize that program, and really get the true benefits of that program for your dog, minimizing the chance for injury is to design the program for the dog in front of you. And think about the equivalent of like uh, human fitness. Um, you have baseball players, soccer players, you have hikers, you have bicyclists, you have people that are, you know, a couch potato and they're trying to get off the couch and, and you know, do their first 5K. And even though you may have different levels of fitness, if I take an elite level swimmer and go ask them to run as hard as they can for a half marathon, like they are so not prepared for that. So the fitness program has to be catered and has to be individualized, thinking about the unique needs of the dog in front of you. And this six step process is going to walk through kind of from the beginning of where you start and the things you need to consider in order to put this fitness program in place. So if you're just now joining me, before I hop in the six steps, let me just give a really quick introduction. My name is Erica Bowling. I am the owner and founder of Northeast Canine Conditioning. I love helping people take their sport dogs and their working dogs and turning them into the elite canine athletes that they are, but also helping our pet dogs in being healthier, living longer, and getting more fit. So hey, Lorene, thank you for joining us. Um, so yeah, are you guys ready to get started? I'm going to show you some slides. Um, I'm thinking about turning these uh, notes, writing up some notes from today. If you're interested in getting today's notes, just uh, just comment and give, say notes, type notes for me. And when I have the notes ready, I need to, uh, to get some time for them to be transcribed and I'll send them to you. So if you're interested in getting the slides or the notes, just let me know. Okay, so this is our Northeast Canine, our Get Fit program design. It is a six step process. And this is a, a process that I teach in our Elite Canine Athlete program that can lead to becoming a certified canine athlete specialist. So we spend a lot of time talking about program design um, in, our, in our program, in our Elite Canine Athlete program. So let's first look at, before I go into the individual steps, we have to think about, here, let me, um, I hope, I'm gonna change the screen so I'll enlarge this and I hope ah, it's a blocking part of it. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll enlarge it in just a second when we get down to some of the, the steps. But let me read this for you. If you can't see the full picture, when we're looking at program design, I'm talking about adult dogs. I'm talking about dogs that are physically mature. Definitely fitness and exercise, that's important for young dogs and senior dogs and dogs, you know, maybe that are overcoming injuries, but they have special considerations. So what I'm going to be talking about today, I mean, definitely the, the idea and the concepts can apply to a lot of different dogs, but I'm going to be predominantly focusing on adult physically mature dogs that are healthy. Um, so Amelia, thanks. Yes. Let me know if you guys want the notes and I'll get them out to you. 
So, um, so in this program design, and this is going to be consistent across every step, we need to be thinking across these steps, is to have a balanced fitness program. So we have flexibility, we have endurance, we have strength training, we have body awareness, and we have sport or work specific skills that you're training your dog, okay? In the center, if you can see it in the center, it says nutrition, proper nutrition. So if you you can have an amazing fitness program, but if your dog is eating crap, if you're getting just bad stuff going into your dog, the performance can really go downhill. So when you're looking at building a fitness program, we really need to look at all of these components. Now, definitely some of these areas will be emphasized more than others, depending on the dog, the activity, the sport, the job that you do. But if you, it's like a runner. It, how many, anybody here is a runner? Any of you done long distance running, marathon training, HSL? Um, so if you are a runner, I'm a runner, is sometimes I ne neglect my stretching. Sometimes I neglect weightlifting. So if all I do is run, 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 I'm going to develop a muscular imbalance between my hamstrings, between my quadriceps. Also, depending on if I'm always running on the flat, if I'm always running up a hill, I'm going to be developing imbalances. And where do I feel it? I'll feel it in my lower back. I'll feel it in my knees. It starts to affect your whole body in a lot of different ways. If you ignore, you get tight muscles, you're not stretching. So this is the same with our dogs. If you want to have a more fit dog, yes, maybe you do lower coursing. What activities do you guys do? Let me know, do you do sports, lure coursing, dock diving, pet dog hiking? Let me know what activities you do. So if I can throw in some examples, I'll try to cater them to what your focus is. But if we're doing this, let's say that if I have a fly ball dog and I just do all fly ball, fly ball, fly ball, I'm, I'm developing imbalances. I'm risking repetitive use injuries. And when I'm developing muscular imbalances, that's setting the dog up for potential injury. And your dog's not gonna perform as well if you don't have a nice balanced program. So that's one thing that you need to keep in mind is having a balanced program. So yeah, so Shannon, dock diving, for example, dock diving, you have a lot of um, sprinting, right? Real short, intense bursts of, of, of energy going off the dock. And so there's a lot of hindquarter work, right? Launching off the dock. Well, if you're not developing the shoulders, if you're not stretching, if you're not getting flexibility and relaxing those muscles in your dog's lower back, you, have you guys seen photos of dogs midair dock diving? Have you seen like their their spine can get, can get like a U to it? Like it actually goes like the opposite direction. They're hyperextending. So flexibility is gonna be really, really important in addition to strong hindquarters and speed and power for those dock diving dogs, you're also gonna to wanna to make sure they're nice and flexible. So that's just an example. So weight pull, great, that's another example. In weight pull, you've got a lot of those muscles working hard. Think about if you're doing nothing but weight lifting and you never do stretching or you never do cardio. You might have those strong muscles, but then you go up a flight of stairs and you about have a, have a heart attack, <laughs> right? So that's an example of why that's so important. So now let's look at the steps going in this process. We have evaluate, we have a whole system for evaluating what we need to do and then implementing what, how and what are we going to implement. And I have three steps I'm going to talk about for that. So let's look at, uh, let's look at evaluate. We're gonna do that first. And this one, I believe I can enlarge it now and I, I won't block it all. So the first step here, would be this is before you do anything with the dog is you want to evaluate your dog's strengths and weaknesses now this would be things like your dog's physical strengths and weaknesses this could be let me give you some examples things that i'll do with dogs we'll do a gait analysis we'll do a structural analysis we'll we'll look at a uh, body condition right so i'll give you an example i have two belgian malinois they, one is about 60 pounds, one is about 80 pounds. Physically, they are very different and they have different strengths and weaknesses. My one Malinois is really long and he is more muscled in the front and the chest and the shoulders and less muscled in the hindquarters. So his weakness is his lower back and his weakness is more his hindquarters. My other Malinois, he's smaller, more compact and more square he has really nice hindquarters. His shoulders are straight, fairly, he, he doesn't have a lot of angulation in the front end, 
and he ha doesn't have a lot of muscle definition, even though when we exercise and stuff, when I, I put extra emphasis on strengthening his shoulders compared to his hindquarters. So that's an example of where I may look at the structure of a dog and kind of looking at what are the, 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 the pros and the cons. And I'm not saying strengths and weaknesses, like I'm not talking about injuries. Okay. Injuries, that's a whole nother conversation. You'd go to your veterinarian, your physical rehabil, you know, your physical rehab specialist, but this is, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm really long in the waist and I have a, a long torso and my lower back. I tend to have lower back issues. I'm not super muscled. I'm not like short and compact. So my physical structure develops strengths and weaknesses in my body. I have strong legs and I have narrow, more narrow shoulders and I'm weaker in my upper body compared to my lower body. So what we have to do is we have to assess a number of different things with the dog in front of us to determine what are that dogs, what are the good points and what are the not so good points. So um, do you guys know what your dog, some of your dog's strengths and weaknesses are? Like I just gave you an example of my two. So, you know, if you, if you think you know where your dog's stronger, let me know and then also where your weaknesses are. Another thing with the strengths and weaknesses might also be, um, I know like right now I've been doing a lot more cardio than I've been doing strength training. So my, both of my dogs, their individual fitness program, I know that the, the, the strength training right now is a weaker area because I have not put in enough attention on it. I've been doing more outdoor stuff and doing cardio. So um, looking at the strengths and weaknesses are really important. Some of the things that I'll do, just to give you a quick example, is um, I will do things, I'll look at there's how they sit, how they stand. Um, I will look at their balance. I look at flexibility. A lot of dogs are more flexible to the left versus the right or the right versus the left. Really easy thing to do is um, lure your dog into tight, tight, slow circles to the right and left and see if your dog has a preference for the right or the left. I know um, anybody here teach fly ball. I know um, I talked to some fly ball instructors when they teach the dog kind of coming off the box, they'll see which side does, does the dog gravitate sometimes more to the left or more to the right. And these are showing you some of those imbalances and some of the preferences. A dog might be stronger in one side, favor one side, go more on one side versus the other. Um, those are some of the things that I'll do. Other things that I'll do, strengths and weaknesses, is I will look at my dog's recovery time. So for example, in the winter time going into spring when my dogs aren't as fit for competition, it takes, it'll takes it take my dogs a lot longer to recover from exercise versus um, when they're in peak physical condition. So that is also when I look at their exercise, how they're doing in their sport, how they're doing in their job, what are their strengths and weaknesses. Jumping might be a weakness. Um, and like I said, it can vary by time of year, right? So, yep, Shannon, you recognize the cardio. Cardio is one of those. In the summertime when I was in South Carolina, cardio was definitely a tough one because it was like 100 degrees outside. Okay, so this is the first thing you do is take the dog in front of you. You look at the breed. You look at the structure. Uh, oh, another example is I look at the angulation. Um, look at German Shepherds. Somebody mentioned Schutzen here. So we got a lot of German Shepherds in, um, in Schutzen. So if you look at um, a German Shepherd, let's say Amer an American bred Shepherd compared to say working line Malinois, they tend to have steeper angles in, in the hindquarters. They're more sloped. And the more angulation you have, you lose some of that stability. So if I have a herding dog, a Shepherd dog with lots of angulation, that dog, if they're really angled in the hindquarters and they're not so angled in the shoulders, depending on the structure of that dog, that hind end can definitely be a weakness compared to the front, right? So when I do physical fitness uh, and I'm working with shepherds, um, compared to a lot of other breeds, they have a lot more angulation. There are benefits to having that angulation. They move more fluid. They have a longer reach of stride. But when you go excess angulation, you're also, well, when you add any kind of that angulation and add more and more, you're losing some stability. So for a lot of those dogs, a lot of the shepherds that I work with, right away we know we need to be strengthening the hindquarters. We need to be working on the lower back. So that's an example of the first thing we'll look at. Um, the next thing is after I assess the individual dog, kind of evaluate where, where is my dog? What's their body condition? Do they need, are they really long in the back? Do they need a lot of um, core exercises? Now what I do is I look at the demands of the job or the sport that the dog does. 
So for example, weight pole. So Dallas, you mentioned weight pole and um, Pam has agility. Ruth says fly ball and Megan says Schutzen. Each of those sports has different demands on the dog's body. So if I do protection sports, um, when they're driving the dog and the dog's on the bite on the sleeve in Schutzen, you've got a lot of stress on the spine, on the neck and on the lower back, right? Then let's go to fly ball. Where's some of that stress on that dog? The shoulders, the front feet, the pasterns. So we've got stress on the body, excess stress in some areas, more so in one sport versus another. Um, also thinking about the weight pull, right? Thinking about um, the harness, the resistance and where it's putting pressure on the body. There's different demands on the body in weight pull. So those are some different examples. So um, another thing that I will do, uh, anybody here do like search and rescue? Um, uh, search and rescue, uh, air scent, uh, trailing, HRD. So one of the demands, I work with a lot of search and rescue people, and one of the demands of that is a uh, cardio, aerobic cardio endurance. Those dogs can be searching for hours and hours and days and multiple days back to back can be searching acres and acres and acres of territory. Very different needs for that dog than a fly ball dog when it comes to cardio. Um, so that's another example of the demands. So yes, Denise, so search and rescue. So it's a different thing um, for the, the needs of the dog. Also, if you do things like dry line mushing, um, bike joring, um, dog sledding, right? And do you know the distance for sprinting and dog sledding? They have sprint races. Well, the sprinting is still, it's like six miles long. <laughs> a sprint is probably what most of us think of a sprint in, in the sled dog world. Sprinting is still a, a pretty long, you know, that's a hard workout or an aerobic workout. And so we have to look at the demands of the sport. Now we can start to get a better sense of what does that dog need for a fitness program? So if I have a dog do it, let me I'll give you an example. If I have a dog doing protection sports, doing Schutzen, and it's a shepherd, and he he's longer than he is tall, and he has um, a lot of angulation in the hindquarters, right? So I have needs for that dog. We need to be looking at the lower back. We need to be looking at core. We need to be looking at the hindquarters, but then we add the bite work. So now we need to be thinking about the shoulders, um, a nice, strong, healthy back and the spine. So when we're building a fitness program, these are things we have to keep in mind when we're putting emphasis on our exercises. We still need that balanced program. We still need to do cardio. We still need to do strength training. We still need to do flexibility, but I'm going to put more emphasis on the areas where the dog needs help. Like my Malinois, um, they'll both get a balanced fitness program, but one dog I'll put, I'll do more exercises for the shoulders and the other dog, I'm going to do more exercises for the hindquarters. They both get shoulders and hindquarter exercises, but I'm going to distribute that differently depending on their strengths and their weaknesses and the demands of the activities they're doing. So does that make sense? Now, the third thing we do, now remember, we're still in the evaluation stage. We're still in the evaluation. So I haven't started assigning exercises for my dogs yet. This is this information right here is what's going to tell us what we're going to assign to the dog for what kinds of exercises, how much exercise, um, how many days per week and what to start with. We're going to use this information here. Now, the next thing we have to consider in our evaluation are the missing components. So what is missing here? So the, the missing components would be, this would be where I would say, oh, you know what? My, um, my search and rescue dog um, is getting a lot of aerobic workout but my search and rescue dog is not getting any strength training, any focused strength training, and I'm not getting the benefits of um, anaerobic, higher intensity cardio activity. Even though I have an activity, even though let's say I do marathon running and it's aerobic, I'm going to perform better and I'm going, my cardiovascularly, I'm going to benefit more if I also periodically throw in some sprinting and some higher intense short sprinting activities, 
rather than just doing long distance running all the time. So I may have a search and rescue dog that's doing really great on the aerobic, but maybe we've had no emphasis on the anaerobic cardio and maybe there's been no emphasis on strength training. So that's going to tell us what we need to highlight in our fitness program, right? Um, let me give it another example. Let's do, uh, here, let's do lure coursing. So lure coursing, I see what a lot of people do is they do a lot of sprinting, 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 <laughs> a lot of sprinting. Um, sometimes they're only doing sprinting on a weekend and the dog isn't getting other types of cardio. So a dog that is doing just a bunch of really short bursts of energy in the short sprints is not going to have that overall stamina and endurance this in the same way as a dog that's going to benefit by doing the sprinting and periodically throwing in some more steady state, longer cardio aerobic workouts. That dog's going to benefit from both. The balance of it is going to be different. My lure coursing dog is going to be doing um, more, say, sprinting activities than my search and rescue dog. But I like to have a balanced program where they're they're both going to get some aerobic and they're both going to get some anaerobic. Um, the other thing that I've seen, uh, I would say in the lure course, almost, you know what, in all the sports I've been seeing in all areas is um, a lot of times a lack of uh, flexibility and stretching massage. So the, the people that are really fanatics in their, in their sports or jobs, they do a lot of training, 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 but not enough um, massage, stretching, working on flexibility. So again, go back to my example of my my um, my lower back, right? I have a long torso. If I'm always working out, working out, lifting weights, running, 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 I have tight muscles, tight muscles, tight muscles. Eventually, it's going to create a problem if I don't balance it out with some flexibility and loosen up those tight muscles. So when we go back to our fitness program, that circle that I showed you, now we look at where is what are our missing components or the components maybe they're not completely missing but you're not doing as good of a job so what are your missing components or the the areas you're weak at uh, let me see let me pull up that uh circle again and i will let's see i'll just pull it up and read it to you so you guys can let me go backwards 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 there we go what is your like i said it doesn't necessarily mean that you are it's completely missing, but it can be an area that you're not doing so well. So we got strength, flexibility, endurance. Um, here, let's call it cardio, aerobic and anaerobic cardio. I should probably say cardio in there instead of endurance. Cardio, cardio endurance, aerobic and ana anaerobic. Um, sport or work specific training skills, body awareness, flexibility, body awareness, and strength. So. So that's what you want to think about when you're building up your program before you design anything is you want to be aware of this, where you're doing, where you're doing things well, where are the things that are missed, what are your dog's physical strengths and weaknesses, and also the demands of your sport and activity. So yeah, flexibility. I think my dogs need more flexibility. I need more flexibility, <laughs> uh, especially my neck, my neck and my, my, uh, my lower back. I, I was supposed to do my stretching today and I did it. So that would be in your evaluation stage. So again, evaluation, strengths, evaluating your dog, your individual dog strengths and weaknesses, demands of the sport or job, and then the missing components, what's missing from the program, okay? Now, once you do that, now we can say, all right, we need, we have an idea of how to move forward when we're starting to implement it. And so when we implement it, as we said, yeah, see a number of people have flexibility, body awareness and flexibility. Yeah, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow I'm gonna do my stretching. I'm gonna do it with the dogs too. So now let's go to step number four, implementing. So the next step is your foundational skills, okay? The foundational skills. So foundational skills could be things like for you know and sometimes the foundational skills are sometimes it's it's your your training it's some of the foundational skills like for example to stretch my dog i can either either lure my dog with food or i teach my dog a sustained hand target where he takes his nose and he holds it to my hand and i can um target it and get him to stretch other things that i do with my dog to help him stretch is i teach him to target like he'll put his front feet on an object 
and he keeps his feet planted on an object and then I lure him up and stretch forward. And um, you know, if you have a dog that won't stand still, <laughs> or if you have a dog that doesn't have a stand command, you're going to be limited in the kinds of exercises you can do. And especially you're gonna be limited on doing, um, you know, using equipment or using objects if your dog doesn't have some basic obedience commands. Other things I've seen people run into challenges is when I've, I've seen a number of like well-trained dogs that can't back up. <laughs> They can't back up in a straight line. Um, dogs that don't have any hind end awareness, they don't do any kind of targeting, any, they're really not paying any attention to what's going on with the hind end. So foundational skills could be things like some basic behaviors in your training so that as you move into more advanced work, you can have those behaviors and then that's gonna help you progress more quickly. Also foundational skills are things like, I'll emphasize a, a proper sit a balance down. So um, we will talk about a tuck sit where the dog is sitting nice and square, nice and tucked. It's like, um, like right now, how many of you are slouching? How many of you are sitting on the couch with the computer in your lap or sitting at a desk and you're like slouching, <laughs> right? If, if you take yourself and do it right now, sit up nice and tall, stand. If you're standing or walking, pay attention to your body. And if you're sitting down, just sit, pull your shoulders back, get your shoulders up, hold your abdominal muscles in, you are engaging muscles and that is going to be working your body. So if we're always letting our dog be sloppy and be sitting all crooked and sitting you know, sloppy on the side, one hip, legs all splayed out, they're not engaging their core, they're not engaging their muscles. Well, they're engaging muscles, but they're not engaging them in a productive balanced way. They're actually, if they're always, if it's more comfortable and they're always leaning to one side and they're always dropping their right hip, they do it over and over and over, months and months, years after years, they're building imbalances. One side of the body is gonna be tighter. One side of the body might be more flexible. So foundational skills, you can do this with puppies, teaching them good, good use of their body posture, encouraging a proper sit when they're in a down, a sphinx down, nice and balanced. Um, body awareness, just some basic stuff that's going to help you move forward. So yeah, posture is so, so, so important. Um, so there's a, it's a combination of kind of basic, sometimes just basic training, basic obedience that you're going to progress a lot faster if you, your dog has these, some of these basic foundational skills and then also foundational skills. A lot of these, you can just practice on the ground. And when my one dog was recovering from an injury and I did not know all of this and he was very sloppy in his sits and very sloppy in his downs, I literally spent like a month just working on a balanced sit and getting him to down and be square and not be lopsided and not all splay legged. And only after we developed these foundational behaviors, then did we move on to equipment. Rushing onto the equipment too soon, that can definitely cause problem. Now, the next one is stabilization. Let me pull this up here and I'll move my head here if it's, it's hiding part of the slide. But it's stabilization, muscular endurance, and strength. And I do have a, a definition. So now that we, we're just getting kind of the basic and the foundations, now we have to build up um, just a good, strong foundation. So I'll give you an example. If I don't work out at the gym, and all of a sudden I go to the gym and I start lifting 50 pound, well, trying to lift 50 pound weights or 25 and doing bicep curls and I have not been practicing, I'm gonna fatigue very, very quickly. My muscles are gonna fatigue. I can overstrain my, I can overdo it and pull, pull a muscle and get sore and get injured. Um, if I don't build out uh, muscular endurance in maintaining, if I'm not used to going out hiking, and I'm used to sitting on the couch all day, and now all of a sudden you're asking me to go out at a competition or a three, let's say a three-day seminar. I'm used to hanging out at home all day, not doing much, and then you take me to a three-day seminar. I'm a dog, you take me to a three-day seminar, now you work my butt off for three days really, really hard. My body is not acclimated for that kind of workload, and you're, you're heading towards injury. If you're doing, doing something like that and you have not built that muscular endurance built up the strength and built up the stabilization. And uh, let me give you another example. 
this one I see a lot of people do. The dog does not have a, a, a solid foundational fitness program. Uh, they, they're very sporadic. Maybe one week you train and then two weeks you don't do much and another week you do a lot for three days and then you do nothing. And then all of a sudden you get on a kick or you get a brand new treadmill and you're like, ooh, we got a treadmill. Let's put the dog on a treadmill. And then you're running the dog on the treadmill and you're putting the treadmill on an incline. Well, you've just now moved into more advanced work that's stressing the body and, and putting demands on the body your dog has not had a chance to get acclimated to. So you're heading for injury if you're doing that. Or if you're in a competition, you're heading for your dog to fatigue and your dog's just not going to have the energy and the strength to get through what it needs to do. So in step number five is where you start to build out your foundation to build strength, stabilization, muscular endurance, to set your dog up with that nice foundation throughout the week, multiple days throughout the week, so your dog's body can start to withstand more demand on it. Only then do you move into the advanced stuff. Because if I don't do running, if I'm not out running three, four days a week, and all of a sudden you put me on the treadmill and put it on an incline and start making me run hills, I'm going to get sore and potentially could have a, 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 a serious injury if I'm putting excess demands on my body like that, right? So um, let me, I told you how to definition for this. Let me give you a, a definition here. So muscular endurance, let me just read this to you because I know when I first learned about this, the, the phrase muscular endurance, you think of cardio endurance, but it's like, what do you mean muscular endurance? So muscular endurance is the ability of your muscles or muscle groups to withstand repeated contractions for an extended period of time. Okay, so it's not, I'm not talking about just like weightlifting, weight training. So let me read the next part. It'll give you another example here. If your muscles need to contract in a similar pattern more than once, you are using muscular endurance. So multiple repetitions of an exercise, whether you're weight training, your resistance training, you're increasing cardiovascular endurance, bicycling, swimming, running. These are all forms of muscular endurance, okay? So when I first learned about this term, I was thinking of like, you know, muscles and strength and I was thinking of endurance with cardio but if you think about it for me to be able to run five miles or 10 miles or two miles that is a form of muscular endurance so if you don't build a foundation in the strength in the cardio and build up that muscular endurance and 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 that stabilization having good core um, good, good stabilizing muscles to kind of provide stability for the dog when your dog's working, then your dog has weaknesses. And if you jump right into the more advanced stuff that you're doing by doing it multiple days a week, hard, intense workouts, you're setting your dog up for failure. Um, so that is, um, that is something that I, I see a lot of people do is their dog is their dog is active, they're training, but they're not consistent and building up a regular fitness program. And then they have a couple you know, weeks where they get super motivated and they just, they jump too quickly into the more advanced work. Um, so that is, uh, that is a concern. Okay, number six. So this is the last one, which I've, uh, I've already kind of alluded to it a few times is your advanced training principles. So now the advanced training pr principles, when I think of canine fitness, some of the advanced training principles, uh, let me give you an example on fit pause equipment. So I have a two fit bones or an exercise uh, peanut and my dog is balancing all four feet on an unstable piece of exercise equipment, okay? That would be advanced because my dog is now having to use advanced balance, body awareness, strengthening, stabilizing muscles. So the danger here is when you have not done all the groundwork and the foundational work and building up muscular endurance, and then all of a sudden, bam, you just throw your dog on an unstable surface, all four feet balancing and engaging everything, and you've not built up to it, that would be an example of kind of jumping too soon into advanced training principles. Another example would be like the hill work that I, I gave you. So what I think of building a foundation, like right now, let's say I take my dog out three days a week, and I'm running three to four days a week and I'm going three to four miles, but it's just a nice steady trot, a nice steady cardio aerobic trot. And I want to build up that foundation. I like to have at least three days a week of building up that foundation. 
and building up the intensity and getting a foundation of a, you know, my goal would be at least three miles. Once I build that foundation, I've been doing it for a number of weeks, then I can start increasing the intensity. Then I can start doing sprint work. Then I can start doing hill work. But that's the more advanced. I've done the hill work and the sprinting and the, the higher intense activity. I've done that after I've already built the foundation and then advanced with that foundation through stabilization, muscular endurance, and building strength. And then now my dog can start to do the more advanced concepts. Think of high intensity workouts, right? When you think of the hit works, hit, hit workouts, anybody do that in the gym, right? When you do the high intensity workouts um, for dogs, high intensity could be heavy weight pull, right? Like, you know, really overloading on the weights. High intensity could be um, the, you know, all out sprinting, short distance sprinting, high intensity sprinting. Um, it could also be, like I said, um, adding the intensity of hill work, a steep hill, running up a hill. That's going to be adding um, more. I consider those to be more advanced training. So questions. So this is the, the process that we use. And uh, I would caution, like I said, what I see a lot of people doing is they don't spend enough time in the evaluation stage. And I see people putting programs together without, number one, people wanting just kind of a generic program. You know, you know here's your beginner, you know, couch to 5K, you know, generic program. Um, and I also see people not um, kind of assessing the knees. Like here's an example, dogs that are doing lure coursing and they're doing high intensity advanced type training, but they have not got the basics because they're overweight. And they've basically gone from like couch potato to all of a sudden on Saturday, you're trying to work your dog like an elite athlete and the dog's overweight. So that would be an example of not starting from that evaluation. Where's your dog? Get your dog's body condition proper, proper weight, build up some good muscle tone, build a foundation. Then we start building up into the more intense workouts. That's going to be your high level activities that we're going to see when your dog's actually competing, right? So, uh, so I think I gave a number of examples. If there is a sport or a job that you do and you're having trouble thinking of an example, you're like, Erica, I don't quite understand what would be an example for my sport. Let me know. Um, and I could throw that in. So, um, so let me just go through and I'm going to, for those of you who just kind of jumped in. So what we're talking about here again is the need for in canine fitness before you dive into and just start giving your dog exercises and activities to do, right? These are six steps. It's a six step process to make sure that you are setting your dog up for success. And also you're doing everything possible to help prevent injury by doing too much too soon or doing things out of order, like jumping into more advanced work when your dog doesn't even have the, the basics. So just to reiterate, we'll go through here. Uh, first three steps, evaluate. You want to evaluate and look at the individual dog in front of you, their strengths and weaknesses, their physical strengths and weaknesses. You're going to look at the dog's uh, structure. You're going to look at your dog's movement, your daily activities, where your where's your dog doing well and not so well. Then we look at the demands of the sport or the job. Where are the, the physical demands on the dog, the physical and the mental demands? What have you been attending to and what have you been ignoring? And that's leading us right into the step number three is the missing components. Based on the dog in front of you, based on the demands of the sport or job, what have you been ignoring or what have you been not giving enough attention to? You need to be aware of that before you build your fitness program. Now with all that information and data collection and observing your dog and assessing your dog, now we implement. Step number four, foundational skills. You're gonna slow yourself down. You're not gonna progress as quickly if your dog doesn't have some of the foundational skills, whether it's some of the basic obedience training or just knowing how to hold their body in a nice balanced position with good posture, right? After foundational skills, we look at, and I still think of this kind of as foundation too, but building upon the foundation, step number five, stabilization, muscular endurance, and strength training. We need to build a solid foundation, build some strength, build some muscular endurance before we start adding excess demand, extra demand on the dog's body. And then that's step number six. 
advanced training principles. Now we're ready to move into the advanced training principles. And if you have a dog that is um, in good condition, a healthy, this is for a healthy adult dog, physically mature dog, um, even if your dog is, um, you know, relatively fit, but you've not had a regular fitness program for that dog, going through this process and building the foundational skills, building step number five, stabilization, muscular endurance and strength, this could take weeks, even for a relatively fit dog, because a lot of times we don't have consistency in our training programs. So sometimes what we need to do, even with our fit dogs, is we need to get really consistent multiple times throughout the week to build up steps number four and five, then we move into the advanced. So that's also another danger and a caution is you may have a nice, healthy, strong dog and you're pretty active with them, but you've not been consistent. And they're probably, I'm sure in step number three, there's some missing components. You haven't kind of filled in the gaps of the areas that are missing. So I don't care what level your dog is, unless you've had a structured fitness program that you've been consistent with week after week after week, all of our dogs are going to have to kind of go backwards and fill in some of these gaps and the missing pieces based on what we assess with the dogs. So the last, I believe I have one more slide for you. The last thing I wanted to share with you here is if you are wanting to know more about how do you actually go through each of these steps in detail, we have in our elite canine athlete program, we spent two whole, gosh, we have about three hours. In addition to our online content, we had like a three hour conversation over two different days, just on step number one, <laughs> just on step number one. And um, we had multiple lessons just on step number two. So if you're wanting to learn more about each of these phases, each of these steps, how to, how to look at the dog in front of you, determine what that dog needs, how to build that fitness program for the dog, I'd encourage you to check out our elite canine athlete program, which can lead to becoming a certified canine athlete specialist. You don't have to do it for certification, but if you're a dog trainer, business owner, a lot of people like to get certified. But if you're if you're a fitness fanatic and you really love this kind of stuff and you really want to learn more about it and learn it in detail and you want to learn how to customize those programs based on the dog in front of you and learn those skills and abilities yourself rather than turning to somebody and saying, hey, give me that generic fitness program for my dog. I encourage you to check it out. You go to EliteCanineAthlete.com. Again, that's Elite Canine. It's the letter K, the number nine, EliteCanineAthlete.com. And that's where you can download our brochure in the program. And uh, look it over if it, you know, if it piques your interest. Um, there's a, a link you can click on to submit an application to meet with me and get more detail or just message me. You can message me on Facebook, send me an email. And then usually what I do is schedule a time to chat with you. We have, uh, we have multiple fitness programs. So this might not be the best one for you, but look it over and then message me if you wanna know more or if you wanna have a conversation to see if it is indeed the right program for you. So um, Marty says, how do you measure resistance intensity in movement sports? Um, flat trail versus hilly trail, um, measure uh, handler versus dog. Let me see if I can understand this. How do you measure resistance intensity? So so you're looking like if, if we're doing the different type of terrain and we're looking at the uh, intensity for the dog, I'm thinking, because you do, um, like if we're doing mushing, right? We can do a flat, we can do hill. Is it in sand? Is it in dirt? That's a good question. It's, it's not like we have a, a, a set system uh, in stone saying, you know, this is intensity at level one, level two. What I, what I teach in our program is we talk about um, that uh, perceived exertion. Uh, in human fitness, we'll see that like, you'll have a scale of like one to 10 or one to 20. And you'll rate it on the how the, the perception of how how strenuous it is. And what we do is we we look kind of what we have this perceived exertion, what what it is that the human is doing on a scale of say one to ten, and we talk about what that would look like on the side of the dog. And the challenge here is like if you're working out, you could be like, oh my gosh, I can barely breathe, you know, I can't go another step. For our dogs, it's a lot more difficult because they can't speak to us in, in the same in the same way as a human can speak to us. They do speak to us. We can read them, but part of it is um, knowing the dogs and knowing the signs of how to read the dog to see how hard that dog is working, how much they're exerting themselves, and then looking at 
the degree of that. So I can look at my dog, let's say if my dog is pulling a sled on ice versus in seven inches of snow, like we know the seven inches of snow is going to be harder, but also we can look at, um, it's kind of like a, a rating of a scale. And um, other things that you're going to have to look at too is, uh, I mean, you have the things like if you're in sand, it's going to be harder than if it's a pretty firm ground, right? Um, if it's a steep hill versus not so steep, we know the steeper hill is going to be more, more challenging. But as far as having like a, a distinct degree um, and or, or a number or a rating, um, it's, it's much harder. And I kind of look at the equivalent of what we do with humans, you know, when you're on the treadmill and you're like on a scale of one to 10 and, you know, a 10 is like, you know, you, you can't go anymore. You're, you're ready to fall over, or maybe you don't even ever get to a 10 and, and, and a one is like, you know, you're just getting out of bed and the heart rate is just starting. <laughs> um, those are some of the things that we can look at, um, as far as how hard the dog is exerting itself. Um, but then also we have to consider, like you said, things like the terrain and the trail. So some of the things that are going to impact the intensity of it is going to be um, steepness uh, and also the type of the, the footing the dog is on. You know, if you're in soft, you know, think if you're, if you're a runner, you go hiking, if you're in dirt or mud or sand uh, versus a hard surfaced, um, you know, dirt, uh, it's, it's going to have different levels of difficulty depending on the surface and the terrain. And then another thing you have to consider also uh, on how hard it is on the dog is the environment you'll have to look at things like the temperature and the humidity, because if you have a low humidity day and it's cold out, the dog's not working as hard. So if you're just looking at the, the workload on the dog, the intensity of the dog, that's also going to have an impact. So you might have a day where your dog's working in rough terrain and it's cooled out and it's low humidity and your dog's doing really, really well and could go for miles. And then you have the exact same terrain and then now you have a, a warmer day and you have humidity, you have to adjust everything. And those are the things that we talk about and that we teach people in the elite canine athlete program is when you have, you know, it's not a fixed thing. You know, they're animals. If you're in an outdoor environment, things are constantly changing. And so this is a really, really important reason why we have to know how to kind of evaluate where the dog is because it's constantly changing. And, and even though we have a set program, we have to continually go back and say, how is my dog doing? Is this too hard? Do I need to back off? Do I, can I do more? And that literally can change day to day because we have so many other variables that, um, especially if you're doing things outside, there's so many other variables that come into play. So those are the kinds of things. It's a much bigger conversation than, than here than for like a one hour show. But those are the types of things that we cover in the Elite Canine Athlete Program of all these different things we have to consider when we're building a fitness program and how do we make adjustments to that fitness program along the way. Um, there's a lot of things uh, that that have to go into place there because there's so many variables you're playing with. And like I said, it can literally what your dog is doing one day, um, you, you may have to completely adjust it the very next day because of all these variables. Right. So hope that it's not like a clean cut. You know, here's your answer. <laughs> but I hope I hope that helped uh, clarify it a bit, Marty. Awesome. So again, if you're interested in learning more, um, check out our uh, program brochures for the Elite Canine Athlete Program. It can lead to be, becoming a certified canine athlete specialist. Go to EliteCanineAthlete.com. It's Elite Canine, the letter K, the number nine, EliteCanineAthlete.com. Look through it. There is a, a link towards the bottom. It's multiple pages long to apply. Um, if you're interested for more information and then I'll schedule a phone call or a video conference call and meet with you and talk about this program and the others and see what would be the best fit. But like I said, if you're looking, if, if you're really, uh, if you love canine fitness, you really want to learn this in detail. You want to learn how to, um, what we just talked about, how design programs, modify programs based on the needs of the individual dog in front of you. This would be the program that I would recommend. Awesome. Cool. All right. So thank you, thank you so much for everybody joining me tonight. A quick reminder that I am here every Friday on my Northeast Canon Conditioning Facebook business page at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. So if you happen to watch this somewhere else or listen to it on our podcast, if you wanna catch us live, I love having you join us. And then also a quick reminder, um, we're doing something new. We just started last month, is the second Friday of the month 
is going to be uh, technology tutorials. And this is great for any of you dog trainers or business owners that are wanting to add more value, um, whether it's adding online resources um, for your face-to-face -face clients or moving some of your support for your clients online. I know for a lot of people, the technology is a barrier or even doing things more. Uh, last time, we, our last tech tutorial, we talked about you know having your handouts. If you have clients and handouts and resources and worksheets, how to turn these things digital and share them with your clients. So if you're a dog trainer or a business owner, you're just wanting to get more efficient in the work that you do, or you're looking at expanding and doing more online, I encourage you to join us. It's the second Friday of the month, 8.30 PM Eastern time on our Northeast Canine Conditioning Facebook business page. And um, that will be our, actually our next show, it will be our technology tutorials. So thank you much uh, thank you thank you again for joining and if you have any questions again please don't hesitate to reach out check out our elite canine athlete.com for our program brochure and i uh, hope to uh, have some conversations with you guys and uh, talk to you guys soon see you next week 8 30 p.m eastern time bye bye for now